Hey everyone, we're going to go into uh, Anthropic closing another funding round. Then we're going to go into um, how Inflection AI received a big check from Microsoft to take all their talent. Then we're going to go into this new third-party testing regime that Anthropic's asking for. And then finally, we're going to talk about the recent executive departure in the uh, being a team after Mustafa took over at Microsoft. So this show is about business, comedy, and AI. Um, it's hosted by two Google veterans. My uh, co-host is currently buying another Hawaiian island somewhere. He's a VP of Eng. I do mergers and, mergers and acquisitions or murders and acquisitions. Um, if you uh, like AI news without the hype, then hit that like and subscribe button. So let's start with the big news. Anthropic just got another tranche of capital. Um, so Amazon just announced that they've, um, they're have planning to invest up to $4 billion in Anthropic for a minority or ownership position. Um, last September, they made an initial investment of $1.25 billion. And today they are uh, going to be giving another $2.75 billion. So that's awesome. It's going to turbocharge Anthropic. It'll give it more capital so they can release even better models. Cloud 3 has been going over well from most folks. In our latest interview, we talk about that. Um, and the the deal, when they did this deal, according to CNBC, the last valuation of the company is $18.4 billion. Um, and over the past year, Anthropic closed five different funding deals worth about $7.3 billion. <whistles> it's a lot of money. Um, and then CNBC also mentions uh, the term generative AI, the mainstream and business vernacular seemingly overnight, and the fields has exploded over the past year with a record $29.1 billion invested across 700 deals in 2023, according to PitchBook. And a lot of those deals are going to go tits up. <laughs> a lot of that capital is going toast, and we're seeing it more and more with the problems over at um, uh, inflection. I mean, they've raised greater than a billion and now they're going to get maybe 600 million back for the Microsoft deal. So those people lost half their money. Um, then we saw with the uh, other company, I can't remember who, who runs that company. Uh, so Ahmad, Ahmad's team stability AI, I mean, Ahmad just left and that company has raised a lot of money and they're kind of going to going into the tubes. So I expect um, all of the money that was thrown in hype over AI is going to start draining away. So it'll be interesting to see how that all all lands because um, a lot of people are just paying and spraying capital. Like venture capitalists didn't want to miss out. So if you had uh, if you had your URL with a dot .ai at the end, they just want to cut you a check. Um, so that was interesting. And then news came out regarding um, the inflection deal. Microsoft pays inflection $650 million. We have a new emoji. It is Mr. Awan Boya Borja. We add in the chat. Supporters can use it by typing sick, sick, ha ha, rag, or just ha ha, rag. If you aren't a supporter, don't let the terrorists win. Support a real AI channel backed by credible research experts, tight comedy, and tempered with real world experience. Thank you to JMT and Reguli11. If it wasn't for them becoming supporters, we couldn't add this emoji. So each person who presses join and supports the show because you know for every hour we produce takes about 10 to 12 hours of research me and joe do good work for you um by you just giving us 2.99 a month that allows us to keep the show going but also you get dope emojis so you know you're probably thinking of use cases you read something where some guy talking about kabbalah and mixing with ai you just scroll down and you just press ha 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 cringe and then lex freeman because he's kissing someone's ass so that's what you could do with this so give it a shot I think it's great licensing deal while poaching top talent, sources say. Um, March 21st, Microsoft has agreed to pay AI startup Inflection about $650 million in cash in an unusual deal that would allow Microsoft to use Inflection's models and hire most of the uh, startup staff, um, including its co-founders. A person familiar with matters told uh, Reuters on Thursday. So we kind of call these like license and release deals. Um, basically, you track will hire talent. And then you get the ability to use some of the IP, um, but you don't buy the the company. It's like just like a it's like a payoff. Um, the high profile AI startup model will be available on Microsoft's Azure cloud service. The source said Inflection is using the licensing fee to pay Greylock, Dragoneer, and some of their investors. The source said saying the investors will get a return of 1.5 times what they invested, um, which is interesting because let's see here. How much did inflection raise? Okay, so it raised 1.3 billion. So I think maybe they're looking at these early investors in the company, um, but I don't know the exact terms of the term sheet. 
Um, and then also this assumes too that the company is going to continue and be profitable and do well. And being that its founders, all of the technical talent are gone and it's a shell of a company, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Um, Microsoft hired Inflection co-founders Mustafa Suleiman and Karen uh, Samoyong on Tuesday, along with most of the 70-person team at the AI firm for a new uh, created consumer AI unit called Microsoft AI. So that was interesting. And then we were talking about this a couple of days ago, um, the Microsoft being head to step down amid AI push. So we're talking about that Mustafa came over and basically he took charge of the AI unit and demoted a few VPs. And so Mikhail... Parkrin's departure, the subject of Monday, March 25th, Bloomberg News Report, comes as a week after the tech giant appointed DeepMind co-founder Mustafa to head Microsoft's AI division. Uh, Parkathan, who had been chief executive for advertising web services, will report to chief technology officer Kevin Scott while seeking a new role. Microsoft told Bloomberg, so it's kind of like on the bench. However, the report notes that's not clear whether Parkrin would exit the company or take a new position inside Microsoft. So it could be on the bench, or they could have given them like a 60-day you know, now you didn't know us to go find something else. But um, Microsoft announced the hiring of Suleiman last week. So that was um, some interesting news there. And then, um, because I enjoy pain, <sighs> Anthropic released uh, a, a blog post on third-party testing as a key ingredient of AI policy. So I'm not going to read it all, but I'll read some segments. Um, Anthropic, we believe that AI sector needs effective third-party testing for frontier AI systems, developing a testing regime and associate policy interventions based on the insights of industry, government, and academia is the best way to avoid societal harm, whether deliberate or, or accidental from AI systems. Um, and then next section, today's frontier AI systems demand a third-party oversight and testing regime to validate their safety. My question mark is really, um, because everyone who's releasing frontier markets, uh, frontier models has their own internal red teaming it's very extensive and they go through the ai ethicist societal harm crap and they hem it all for half a year before they release the model and we release gpt one two three and then four to the public and each time the ai ethicist party has said it will be destruction of society so i i am not buying this argument but this is what they firmly believe um in particular, we need this oversight for understanding and, and analyzing model behavior relating to issues like election integrity, harmful discrimination, and potential for national security misuse. So election integrity, gosh, since the beginning of the print, printing press, or since the beginning of writing, um, th there's always been election integrity issues. People have always been producing propaganda. It's like now you can use AI to do it. But uh, one can make the argument that over time what happens to uh, – Steve Pinker is mentioning this um, – over time, we become desensitized to it, and we begin to become skeptical of political messages that we hear, um, even from deep fakes or other types of sources of information. We start believing, like, hey, how can we really trust what's going out here? Do we have a third party to to validate what's going on? So, if you know, Russian bot AI is doing posts on Reddit, or he doesn't even have that account, and they're attacking Biden or Trump or something, people are going to go to the third parties that actually trust the validity of information is valid or not. So I think this election integrity thing is really oversold. And if it turns out that Biden loses, then you're going to see the Democrats go over it. And if Republicans lose, they're going to go over AI too. So we'll see. It's going to be interesting. Harmful discrimination. I, again, I think that one's really, really oversold. We have this person named Timbuktu something who is an AI ethicist inside of Google, Google's AI team and constantly going after all the AI researchers and calling them racist and things like that created this huge distraction that prevented them to get any real work done. Um, I think that this is harmful discrimination is like extremely subjective. And we saw that Google, Google, uh, um, Google's Gemini overcorrected for that and actually was more, it was more racist than if they would not have tried to put in the AI ethicist garbage. So uh, I'm not buying their arguments here. And then I mentioned a robust third party uh, testing regime seems like a good way to complement the sector specific regulation as well as develop the muscle for policy approaches that are more general as well. So it seems like a good way to complement. So they want government law and then another third party, third party testing agency to basically replicate what these large organizations are already doing internally, which then creates more layers of hurdles from getting the AI in your hands. So the AI it's helping with work, the AI it's giving you medical information to help you because you don't have health insurance. The AI is helping with your therapy. They want more hurdles to prevent that from going through. Through They want someone to raise their hand and be like, uh, well, 
I don't like what the model did here, so let's uh, do what Google did and just put that model into the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark um, government facility area and just lock it in there for seven or eight years until someone else brings it out. So they just want to do – they basically want to replicate the mistakes that Google is making, but they want to put it in a government level with teeth so that no one can do anything. Um, so they also mentioned an effective third-party testing regime will give people – and institutions more trust in the AI systems. Like, I, to, to, according to them, like right now, trust is, I go to ChatGPT and it works. Um, trust is OpenAI is the first company that's brought AI to 7 billion people. Trust is the models are pretty reliable and get work done. Um, it, maybe in their elite towers that they, they need a, a government body or something, but I, I, there's a lot of assumptions in their arguments. Um, it needs to be precisely scoped such that the passing as test is not so great a burden that small companies are disadvantaged by them. Um, but then if you make them easy enough, then what's the point of these tests? Uh, be applied only to narrow set of the most uh, computationally intensive large-scale systems. If implemented correctly, the vast majority of AI systems would not be within the scope of such testing regime. Uh, provide a means... Oh, so that's another thing. Um, they need to put an inflation... Um, adjustment on these. Like, one of my common criticisms of, of regulation of any form is like, yes, you pass minimum wage, but you don't include include an automatic inflation adjustment so that you don't have to re-litigate this each time. Um, or you don't include that adjustment, and then eventually what one thought, like, okay, I don't know, this is a stupid example, but like, we think that milk is $3 a gallon, and it should never cross $50 a gallon. That's the new like ceiling and everyone's like, okay, great. Yeah. And so there's no inflation adjustment. And then over time, 2% per year inflation increases. And then eventually what uh, fix for inflation relative cost just for inflation at three ninety nine or a $3 uh, uh, milk is still the same priced in, in inflation adjusted uh, currency, but now it's at like $60, $70 to just produce it. And so then now the milk companies can't produce any more milk and then we have shortages and it sucks. So, Whenever they do produce legislation, I want to see some type of inflation aspect for compute, something that maybe it's based upon Moore's Law that says, okay, here's a threshold for something being a frontier model, and then every year that's in, in, increased by 10%. Because eventually, what we think is a crazy amount of compute to train these, we're going to actually have systems, desktop machines are going to be just as powerful. And people are like, really? No way. Well, for instance, um, I remember seeing a, a, a picture of some mainframe being loaded into uh, some facility back in the 50s or something, and it had like 8 KBs of processing power, and it was like the size of a house, and eventually IBM, the founder of IBM, was like, one day, like, I mean, these machines, like, these computers, only maybe like five or six people will want these machines, so you'll never have them, like, in people's houses and things like that. There's no need. Well, times change pretty quickly. Um, and once you do pass legislation, I mean, it's so hard to get any legislation passed. Once you, I mean, once you get it passed, like, good luck having Senate or Congress looking at it again within your lifetime. So they could pass something really foolish, or there could be a big breakthrough in just Silicon, and then all of a sudden it could lead to huge upside potential. But now we have this one little body that's calling all the shots, and they're very slow, and they're captured um, by regulatory capture, and they become corrupt, and now everything's slowed again. So we basically have outsourced the mistakes of Google, but put it into a government, and that's not good. Um, then going down, these systems, these systems are extremely capable and useful, but they also present risk of serious misuse or AI caused accidents. Uh, to be honest, like I keep on hearing about this. I heard a lot about this from GPT three, three point five, and four. How it's going to create chemical weapons. How it's going to destroy this and that. But I don't know how many more guests I need to bring on the show to like show you all like the current architecture. You can tell it to try to do something malicious, and it will do something. Maybe, it can produce something malicious in one prompt. But as far as it's like, okay, um, I want you to write a program that breaks into people's emails and then it somehow gets their credit card information and sends the information back to me. Like all those steps of it doing it, it might like, it might create a plan for doing this. But as far as executing this plan, all it takes is like, oh, sorry, uh, something wasn't synced properly between the email client or something or, or, oh, sorry, like I was trying to open your Chrome browser to then maybe um, to, uh, open up uh what was that what do people use it's on google cloud that you when you want it's like a python but it's specifically for running like tpus whatever just them just the lm trying to open up a uh, ide it causes it to like forget what it's doing so i think a lot of this is like really over overstated um now the counter to that it's like oh well 
they're talking about what it is today, but tomorrow it's going to be far more powerful. Agreed. Got it. Um, and so what I was doing was historically, um, where, do we have any examples of a new technology it comes out and then before it even like people are actually adopting it and using it, like the idea of a car and people made it clear to me, I use the word like too much. Well, Try going to school with Valley Girls for most of your career. The word just gets embedded in your mind. I'm working on it. Sorry. I'm also working on swearing too. Uh, if you look at the car, the car was, it was roughly invented in 1876. And then in around World War I, only maybe 10% of Americans had it. And then it wasn't until 1930 that maybe 50% of Americans had it. And then it wasn't until like the 1970s before we actually had some real like control and regulation. Chat GPT came out. In um, in October, uh, November thirtieth, twenty twenty two. Let me get my dates correctly. Twenty three, twenty. Yeah, time goes by quick. And so, like, we're like, we're at point zero 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 one percent of the journey, and they're already asking, like, let's let's create regulation. So, let's um, see what ChatGPT says. Uh, look at the following examples. Uh, one were the with these technologies launched, and one were the government regulatory bodies released to monitor them. And so I, I, I got I got that paragraph I was talking about mentioned. Um, this type of industry wide testing approach is unusual. Most important sectors of the economy are regulated via product safety standards and testing regimes, including food, medicine, automobiles, and aerospace. So ChatGPT said your query touches on a broad range of technologies and regulatory bodies um, designed to oversee oversee them within the United States. Let's break down the establishment of regulatory standards and agencies for the sectors mentioned: food, medicine, automobiles, and aerospace. Technology launch. The, yeah, there's no <laughs> food. I guess <laughs> when agriculture came about, like tens of thousands of years ago. The processing and distribution of food have been practices for centuries, but industrialization of food production significantly expanded in the 19th century, so 1800s. Regulatory by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, is a primary uh, body regulating food safety. It was formally established in 1906 with the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act, and I believe that was passed by Teddy Roosevelt because he read the book called The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, and it basically talked about just how terrible things, the conditions were in these meatpacking industries and how foul it was and how they weren't taking care of the food. And he was, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt was like eating canned food. While he was reading this book, I was like, oh, my God, someone give me a, a, a legislative aid or give me a senator so we can pass some legislation. Medicine, um, the development of distribution of medical products have a long history, but significant regula regula regulation began in the early 20th century with the rise of more complex pharmaceuticals. The FDA also responded for uh, regulating medications. Its role of drug regulation was solidified with the Federal uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in 1938. Automobiles. automobiles automobiles became commercially available in the late 19th, early 20th century, with Ford Model T introduced in 1908. The National Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, was established in 1970 under the Department of Transportation. Its creation was largely in response to growing concern over automobile safety in the 60s. Um, so this is a conservative estimate. Yes, commercialization in 1908, but... Um, the idea they they had very expensive versions of this in the 1870s or so um highlighted by the publication of unsafe at any speed by ralph nader in 1965 yeah with no seat belts and things like that very good arguments but we didn't get to that point the cars got much faster and we actually to see the crash test data i mean a lot of people were still using horses back in the, up to 19 30s up to 50s, so it took time for us to get there. Um, aerospace, aerospace technology, particularly for commercial and military use, developed rapidly in the early mid 20th century. Me and Joe talked about that in a previous episode. The FFA was established in 1958 as a federal avi uh, aviation agency and later became part of the Department of Transportation in 1967. So the Wright brothers, like what in the early 1900s? Uh, let me see real quick. Uh, when when did Wright Wright brothers? Uh, Kitty Hawk flight happened, I mean, 1903. So again, you're looking at like some 50 plus years. Um, okay. Um, are there any private industries that are not regulated, but players in the industry regulate themselves? And so they talk about data privacy and security, content mod mo uh, moderation, cryptocurrency, environmental standards, advertising, video games. Um, and the reason I brought this up is like, they don't need to go through this third-party regime. They can all create a coalition. Um, Microsoft, OpenAI, uh, Anthropic, Google, and whatnot. And then it's like their own little board, and they fund it, and you get a little stamp of approval and something, and then you start marketing it, and then people are like, oh, does it have the AI stamp? I'm not going to use this unless it has the AI stamp. Kind of like fair trade and whatnot. 
and then you go from there. Um, but it's just because 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 Doughboy and Sam Altman have a disagreement and a falling out. Probably they don't want to do it because they want someone else in charge. It's really it's just really terrible and distraction. What are possible criticisms of pushing for AI regulation before the technology has reached maturity? Pushing for AI regulation before technology has, uh, has matured can be met with several criticisms and concerns. These include premature constraints, one-size-fits-all approach, cost of compliance, global competitiveness, rapid evolution of AI, lack of expertise, bias in regulation, limiting public benefit. Um, so I thought that was um, I thought that was pretty interesting. So give me one second. I had one more I wanted to go over here. Um, so, okay. So I asked it this question. I said, any case in history where a regulatory regime was created too early, which led to the destruction of industry? Um, in the early 20th century, as aviation technology was just beginning to develop, some countries implemented strict regulations that inadvertently hampered the growth of their nascent aviation industries. A notable case involves France and the United States during the interwar period 1918-1939. After World War I, France was the leading aviation country in the world with a significant number of aircraft and pilots. However, the French government implemented a regulatory regime that was heavily bureaucratic and protective of existing manufacturers. This included stringent controls over aircraft manufacturing operations, which made it difficult for new entrants to compete and for existing companies to innovate. As a result, the French aviation industry stagnated, and for a time, by the time World War II began, it had a fall behind the other nations, notably Germany and the United States. Hmm, that really hurt them during World War II. Yikes, in terms of aviation technology and production cap uh, capacity. United States and contracts. The United States took a more laissez-faire approach in the early days of aviation. The Air Mail Act of 1925, also known as the Kelly Act, allowed private companies to carry mail, which helped stimulate the aviation industry. It wasn't until the Air Commerce Act of 1926 the U.S. government began to regulate air commerce more directly, focusing on licensing pilots, standardizing aircraft, and improving air navigation systems. This regulatory approach was designed to support and grow the aviation industry rather than control it tightly from the outset. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Let's go back to where I was over here. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share. Uh, we're all, let's go here and support us on Twitter. Let's support us, like follow us on Twitter. Um, okay. Systems also have the potential to display emergent autonomous behaviors, which could lead to serious accidents. For instance, systems might insert vulnerabilities in the code that they are asked to produce or when asked to carry out a complex task with many steps, carry some actions which contradict human intention. So like humans are already doing this. And how do we fix that? We do a code review. People look at things, you know. Um, it couldn't in certain vulnerability if it was an anthropic model that was taught to be mischievous, but it could insert a vulnerability due to just it making a mistake, hallucinating, and that's why the engineers need to review it. So, like, I'm still not buying this. Um, however, although Anthropic is investing in our RSP, Responsible Scaling Policy, and other organizations are doing the same. We believe this type of testing is insufficient as it relies on self-governance decisions made by single private sector actors. Ultimately, testing will need to be done in a way which is broadly trusted, and it will need to be applied to everyone developing frontier systems. This type of industry-wide testing approach isn't unusual. Most important sectors of the economy are regulated via private. I went over this, but uh, based on what I'm getting at is, like, I also think there's going to be a degree of regulatory capture, and this is a way for them of, like, hey, maybe for some other reason, they're not releasing the best models anymore. Like Claude 3 is fantastic, but they might get gun shy. They might start drinking their own Kool-Aid. But then you create more regulatory capture, m more laws to protect them that allows them to rest their laurels and just be really tight with this third-party um, licensing regime. They can then infiltrate it and say, hey, you know, um, let's make these standards more according to the way that uh, Anthropic does things. Even though other companies do it differently, it's okay. We want it to be the anthropic way, which could be a way for them to throw some sand in the gears of other um, AI companies. It's Okay, so um, what would a robust testing regime look like? A robust third-party testing regime can help identify and prevent the potential risk of AI systems. It will require a shared understanding across industry, government, and academia of what an AI safety testing framework looks like, what it should and shouldn't include. Like, first of all, shared understanding. I mean, we mentioned it before, like... OpenAI had a pretty robust red teaming of for G, uh, ChatGPT and GPT-4, but friggin' people at Anthropic thought it wasn't good enough, and so they left. And then, because they're cucks, they decide, oh, ChatGPT was good. We were the cucks. I guess we should release Claude 2 to everyone, you know? And now, they haven't learned their lesson, so now they're, they're saying, no, 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 we need a shared understanding across the industry to get any of these models out. And I think it's friggin', you're never gonna have that. You need a vibrant community of different AI companies releasing different models, um, which creates dynamic stability. It's like the 
the, the Greek city states model of having all these little small city states and whatnot, and they all keep each other in check and compare the Roman model of just the empire uh, dominates everything and it eventually collapses and creates a gigantic dark ages. Um, when you have smaller, different AI labs experimenting different ways, good ideas spread, bad ideas don't spread, or bad ideas are actually checked by other people who have models out there. So I, I just don't think this is a good idea. Um, going through the rest of it, an initial uh, period where companies complete practice runs of implementing such testing, sometimes third-party oversight. They're already doing this already. Also, here's another thing. For Microsoft Tay, we talked about this a lot. There's a lot of reputational risk. If you're spending, raising billions of dollars to train one of these models and you release something half-baked, good game, your company of raising money, again, good game ever getting customers, good game getting hired anywhere else. And that fear of God is running in through the veins of a lot of these people here too. So there is the court of public opinion that they think that people are completely ignoring and that these people are just reckless. Um, a two-stage testing regime, there should be a very fast automated testing stage that companies apply their systems. This stage should cover a wide area and be uh, biased towards avoiding false negatives. If the stage spots potential problems, there should be a more thorough secondary test, like using an expert human-led elicitation. And again, how deep do you want to go? Uh, a lot of the red teamers in GPT-4 were like, no, you shouldn't release this. This is crap, blah, blah, blah. Because there's a lot of tinfoil hat wearers in the AI ethicist crew and AI researchers who are, no matter what, are just going to continue to play devil's advocate on things to ad nauseum. And eventually you need someone to put daddy or mommy pants on, like Mira Moretti, Sam Altman, or Kevin Scott. Hey, everyone. So folks told us to clean up our language, and we were ignoring it for a while until some like wrote message saying they drive in the morning with their kids and the only time they get with their kids is like in the morning and they want to be bonding time and they really like the podcast so they want their kids to be able to listen to it too and i was like jesus christ that's like child abuse so if you could jordan joe like please clean up your language and they said it very nice and i was like oh god so what i decided to do is um every time me and joe cuss uh we give 25 dollars to different foundations so uh we give 125 dollars to this is St. Jude, the really wonderful stuff. You should go to St. Jude. You should go to stjude.org. It's stjude.org and donate. And then we donated um, some money to uh, Shriners. One of our members, Paxton, said this is a really good place. So go to donate.lovetorescue.org. And you can give some money. We gave 125 bucks. That was about 10 curse words that we edited out of the episode. Uh, Joe had one of them. I had the nine other ones, but then I did it because I just wanted to donate money, not because I forgot about it. And, you know, anyways, don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye. But and say, no, we're going to run, we're going to release this because there's no way for you to get the nth degree of every risk possibly thought of. Um, increase, increase resources. Uh, to parts of the government that will oversee and validate tests, building and analyzing tests is detailed, expensive, technical work, so governments will need to find a way to fund entities that do this. Um, I could keep, let me keep going here. I'm getting, I'm getting, I read, I read my 10,000 hours of their book, and it starts weighing on me mentally. Um, we believe that we and other participants in AI development will need to run multiple testing experiments to get this right. The stakes are high. If we land on an approach that doesn't accurately measure safety, but is easy to administer, we risk not doing anything su substantive or helpful. If we land on an approach that accurately measures the safety, but is hard to administer, we risk creating a testing ecosystem that favors companies with greater resources and thus reduces the ability for small actors to participate. They mentioned their bias in here, which is obvious because they are a big player. Um, but again, there's nothing in the market that says that we need to actually push this right now. I don't know why they're pushing so hard for this. And it, you, they've even done, they did Senate testimonies. The senators are like, we have laws in the books. We have things to protect against this for misuse and whatnot. Like, why do you want another agency here that could possibly be gamed? And no one really heard any good answers. Um, so. Openly disseminated or open source models. Science moves forward largely due to a culture of openness and transparency around research. This is especially true in AI, where much of the cur currently unfolding re uh, revolution is built on open publication of research and models like Transformer BERT, Vision Trimper, and so on. There's also a long history of open source and openly accessible systems, increasing the robustness of get to it, blah, blah, blah. We believe that the vast majority of AI systems today, perhaps even all of them, are safe to open disseminate and will be safe to broadly disseminate in the future. However, we believe in the future it may be hard to reconcile, reconcile a culture of full. Well, that's actually a freaking lie. lie. When GPT, like I mentioned, when ChatGPT and GPT-4 is coming out, they didn't think it was safe. But now it's like, oh, it's been out, it's safe. Like, so, again, they're moving the goalposts. 
However, we believe in the future it may be hard to reconcile a culture of full open dissemination of frontier system AI systems with a culture of societal safety. Basically, they're saying we don't trust you, but we trust ourselves. But we don't trust you. You know, we don't trust you for using it for good good causes to make your life better. We don't trust you, but we trust ourselves. That's just that's just code words. A complex way for them to put it. If and the if is key and a result point. Increasing capabilities of AI models can lead to detrimental effects or hold the possibility of catastrophic accidents that we'll need to adjust the norms of what's openly disseminated at the frontier. So basically, they're kind of pushing for regulation of open source models. They want to lock that down. Shocker. Specifically, we'll need to ensure that if AI developers release their systems in a way that provides strong guarantees for safety. For example, if we were to discover a meaningful misuse for a model, we might put in place classifiers to detect and block attempts to elicit that misuse, or we might gate the ability to fine tune the system behind a know-your-customer rule, along with contractual obligations not fine-tuned towards specific misuse. Um, so, like, again, they tried to lock down Claude 2 really hardcore, and you couldn't with it, and they eventually got the feedback from the market, and then Claude 3 came out better. But people, like, um, they combine two things. They combine, like, AI risk of AI, you can ask it to do things, and it can do attempt to do bad things, but then you have all the security, level of security we have in our computers and systems from like firewalls to encryption to passwords and things like that. Just because you have a strong AI model doesn't mean all of a sudden all that goes away. And then the people who manage these APIs, people who manage corporate security will see, hey, we're getting a lot of requests from a certain AI model, AI model do things are mischievous. Okay, let's like block that model from accessing these systems or whatnot. So they act like it's an all an all or nothing thing and there's no there's no other countermeasure. It's like AI comes alive and then before you know it, there's blood in the streets, nukes are going off, and we're all dead. It doesn't work this way. So um like inherent is doomerism in their thoughts. Um why we're being careful in, in what we advocate for the AI, in AI policy. When developing our policy positions, we assume that regulations tend to create an administrative burden, both for party and enforce the regulation, the government, and for the party targeting regulation, AI developers. Therefore, we should advocate for policies that are both practical and enforced feasible, uh, feasible to comply with. We also know that regulations tend to be uh, accurate. Ac Accretive, once passed, regulations are hard to remove. Therefore, we advocate for what we see as the minimal viable policy for creating AI in the ecosystem and will be open to feedback. Um, so, like, I say proof's in the pudding. I've read multiple of your goddamn articles on, like, AI risk and how we need policy and blah, blah, blah. Put the MVP out there with specific, like, what you want in this legislation and what it will do. So then all people can look at it and have something open, something they can openly criticize. What we don't want to have happen is we push for a body, a third-party body that gets voted on, and then the people in that body determine what the rules are because then we're just rebuilding what's going on in Google right now, and that's been very bad. So um, I tend to lean more on laissez-faire on this stuff, um, and I think this is still a nascent area. There's a, I mean, I love these models. There's a lot of shortcomings in models if you use them regularly, and so I think a lot of this, I, I question the motives. I think there's a deep psychological fear in what they're doing. There's also mistrust in society. There's also a way for puffing themselves up of, oh, my hands are so powerful. I have Oppenheimer syndrome. I'm creating like nuclear bombs with the keystrokes. So there's a lot of things mixed in there. And I just wish they could just, you can continue to do what you want in your own little freaking corner. And if you want to regulate yourself, and put yourself in a ball where your no good models get released, great, do it. But then for other people who trust society and want to release more powerful models because they realize, yeah, one out of maybe 100,000 kooks are going to try to find some exploit that once the exploit's found, just like Google Chrome has a bounty system, right now they pay bounties for people who find exploits. Once someone finds an exploit, something happens, then there's going to be a bounty probably and they can, they can fix the model. So that's why I think iterative deployment is so important. They believe the old model of just give it to a team of 50 AI ethicists for six, seven years and never have it see daylight um, compared to the open AI model of get something in users' hands and then learn through that experience. So anyways, love to hear your all thoughts. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share. Talk to you all later. Bye.